Welcome to Mark the Evangelist and the challenging times in which he put the gospel in writing. I'm Gene van der Zanden. This is an illustrated PowerPoint presentation. It's a little over an hour long. Of course, you can stop it at any time you need to and resume later. It's more fun, of course, to be in the same room. We perhaps do get more out of a presentation in person, but we're putting it on the website to give you an opportunity to see it at your own convenience. We'd like to hear from you as to how you like or don't like this method of presentation. For most of us, there's a gap in our knowledge. Our image of how and when the Gospels were written may be fuzzy. Our knowledge of the mid-first century history may be hazy. The Gospels were written, scholars tell us, beginning in the late 60s, which are beyond the time of Jesus and Peter and Paul. So we don't focus on them very much at church. They're beyond the time of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. But when we bridge this gap, the, uh, the Gospels become much more meaningful. This chart shows the scholarly consensus on the dates in which the Gospels were put in writing. It shows Mark first, being written, put in writing between 64 and 69 AD. Scholars believe that Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel were put in writing in the 80s AD, and John came later in the 90s. How do they know that? How do they know the dates? Well, beginning in the middle of the 20th century, beginning in Germany, Biblical scholars began a scientific approach, looking at the spelling of the names of places, the spelling of the names of people, idioms used in the language, and references to historical events. These exist within the biblical texts, and they're kind of fingerprints showing what the dates were. When this was first uh, put forward in Germany, two interesting things happened. One was, some other scholars said, oh, this explains a lot. We never understood why Mark's gospel existed, because if it was an abbreviated version of Matthew, what would be its purpose? If Matthew was the first gospel written, which formerly was thought, if Matthew was the first gospel was written, what would be the purpose of having an abridged version? But once they saw the dates, they said, oh, hey, I get it. Marx was first. Marx is more primitive. Mark was the pioneer. Mark was the one who began it all in putting the gospel in writing. The other interesting thing that this uh, process produced was that the Catholic Church, beginning with Pope Pius XII, said, Catholics need to be in on this scholarship. Catholics need to be a part of it. And he placed emphasis on it, and Catholics have been a part of the scholarly work ever since. When I say it's the scholarly consensus, it really is. It's become solid now, very, very solid, among mainline Protestant scholars, Catholic scholars, Orthodox scholars, and even the Jewish scholars that participate in those conferences. Now this chart shows the two-source theory. This is an interesting concept, but it came about after these dates were established and scholars began to look at Mark as the primitive version that came first. They then saw that Matthew in the purple was derived from Mark. That's what the arrow going from Mark down to Matthew indicates. And that Luke was derived from Mark. That's what the arrow going from Mark down to Luke indicates. In other words, Matthew and Luke had a copy of Mark's gospel in front of them as they did their work. 
you see a dotted uh, green box with a letter Q inside. This is an explanation of where the sayings of Christ came from. Matthew and Luke both have a lot of the sayings of Jesus that are not found in Mark's gospel. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in Luke, the parable of the prodigal son. Passages like that are important to us. They make the whole gospel more meaningful. And so for most of us today, we favor using Matthew or Luke for our gospel reading and study. But this chart shows the genealogy, so to speak, how the two sources were used to create Matthew's gospel and to create Luke's gospel. It's currently called the two source theory. The, the Q source document that has the sayings of Christ no longer exists. That's why it's a dotted line. But it's inferred, it's inferred from the similarity of the stories in Matthew and Luke. When Matthew and Luke have re make reference to the same story, um, it sounds pretty close. It sounds pretty close. And that's how scholars look at Q, the source of the saying of Jesus, as an independent document that may have existed at the time Mark wrote. At this point in the presentation that I give live, I usually ask the people, how many of you are familiar with what's on this chart? And how many of you are not? Well, about half of the hands go up with either question. In other words, about half the people have some familiarity and about half the people don't. But let's not worry about that. Let's just understand that it is represent the solid consensus of scholars today. And the more we know about Mark and the more we know about the challenging times in which he put the gospel in writing, the more it helps us to get meaning from the gospels. You see, the gospel spread before there were written texts, and that was an amazing marvel by any standard. This map shows the journeys of St. Paul. We know those were in the, from the late 40s AD into the 50s and up to the beginning of the 60s. St. Paul covered the eastern part of the Roman Empire with these journeys. He went from city to city establishing churches or nurturing and helping in the churches that already were established. It's important to know that Peter and other apostles actually began journeying to some of these cities even before Paul. They were spreading the gospel before St. Paul did. Peter had moved to Rome and became Bishop of Rome in the second year of Claudius, which means Peter was in Rome in 42 AD. That's earlier than most of us probably thought it was. But Peter was living in Rome beginning in 42 AD. And when he appears, when we hear of him appearing in a conference in Jerusalem, or Antioch, or Damascus, or places like that. Peter traveled, Peter sailed in a ship to those places for those meetings. But it's an amazing marvel that the gospel spread before there were texts, before there was anything in writing. The Holy Spirit, of course, was a part of that. The, Holy, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit guided the church in these first formative years. But what human effort also was involved? Here's a painting by Raphael depicting St. Paul preaching in Athens. That's probably pretty close to what it actually was like because traveling preachers traveled. They went from place to place. Very few people could read or write. The preachers may have used outlines, some sort of list of keywords that helped them to remember what they were supposed to pre pre present. 
but the preachers themselves may not have been literate or they may not have been highly literate. So there emerged two presumed early written gospel sources. The saying source, Q, that was shown on that consensus of scholarship chart, and another document that is inferred from Mark's gospel, a document that probably told the story of the passion of Christ from the agony in the garden through the placing of him in the tomb. The fingerprints of that supposed document, which no longer exists, are these. The story as it's related in Matthew, in, excuse me, the story as it's related in Mark and also in Matthew and Luke is a continuous narrative, continuous from start to finish, where the other episodes that are in the Gospels in Mark's chapters 1 through 12, those are short episodes, little vignettes, short accounts of things that Jesus did from day to day. And they kind of go from day to day with no particular order. They're kind of strung together like pearls on a string. So scholars assume that these two sources may have existed. The saying source, which was compiled by who knows who, possibly compiled by a number of people over the years, and a passion document that was probably written by one person at one time. Could that have been St. Mark? Yes, it could have. Very possibly it could have been St. Mark, or it could have been another person, and St. Mark had access to both of these documents when he began the Gospel. Well, what led up to the written Gospels? What led up to the Gospel being put in writing? That's probably the better way of saying it, because the Gospel existed from the time that the disciples went to the empty tomb and saw that Jesus was not there. The Gospel is the good news. The story of Jesus, the story of his life, the story of the crucifixion, and the story of his resurrection. That's the Gospel. But what led up to it being put into a written form? Well, for one, those who saw Jesus were getting old and dying. By the mid-60s AD, they were on average, if they were the same age as Jesus, in their mid-60s. So they weren't going to be living too much longer. Secondly, the expectation that Christ would return, would return soon began to wane. I'm talking about the second coming of Jesus. Initially, Christians thought that Christ would return to earth in their own lifetimes. They expected him to come back. And, the, and the, that expectation may have been part of what caused the putting of the gospel into writing to be postponed. But by the mid-60s, that whole expectation had begun to wane. When St. Paul wrote his letter to the Thessalonians in the 40s AD, he thought that Christ would be returning soon. That's very clear in the letter to the Thessalonians where he says, When Christ returns, the dead shall be raised, and we all will be caught up with him in the air. However, by the time St. Paul was writing his last letters, such as the letter to the Romans, which is dated late in the 50s, possibly as late as 60, he makes no reference to the timing. St. Paul knows that Christ will return, but he no longer thinks it's going to be soon. So the expectation that Christ would return soon began to wane. Yes, that's a second reason why the Gospels need to be put in writing. And then third, and perhaps most significant, in 64 AD, the Romans executed both Peter and Paul, within a few months of one another. This was under the persecutions of Nero. They were both executed 
either in late 64 or early 65 AD. This slide shows Peter being crucified upside down, lifted up into that unwieldy position by Caravaggio, a Renaissance painter. Paul was decapitated. Yes, Paul had his head chopped off by the Romans for similar reasons. Nero was eliminating Christians. But these two events crystallized the need for the Gospels to be put in writing. These two great leaders were no longer present, and a written document was necessary. Well, this model, this approach, this understanding of how the Gospels came to be, it provides a lot of answers, but it also can raise many questions. When I was studying at Seattle University in the 1980s and 1990s, a number of questions entered my mind. And I'm gonna share those questions with you and the answers that finally helped to resolve them. First, to understand this model means that we have to have a different understanding than the classic inspiration of inspiration by the Holy Spirit. I think that many people, most Christians, had an understanding of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as almost being to the point where the writer of the gospel was like a puppet on a string under the control of the Holy Spirit. This illustration from a ninth century German Bible depicts St. Mark sitting at a table with an open book, and there's a winged lion who's telling him what to write. That winged lion, I guess, is um, uh, representative of the Holy Spirit. Well, we've kind of moved away from that. The Holy Spirit, we believe, scholars tell us today, the church tells us today, is very critical, very much a part of the process. But the human passion, the faith of the writer, the faith of his sources, those all are a key part. This slide from the 17th century France shows Mark seated with a book on his lap and a quill pen in his hand, and he's being told things by St. Peter. And St. Peter is telling Mark what to write. Well, now that's a little closer to our understanding today, a little closer to how we, we visualize and imagine the partnership between the Holy Spirit and the human participants. A second concern that I had, a big one for me, was I said, wow, if the gospel was spread throughout the whole Roman Empire without being put in writing, how reliable was that? I got worried about the unreliability of oral transmission. I kind of felt like I was, as I was studying these things, that I was walking out onto thin ice and the ice was getting thinner and thinner as I went forward. I hoped I would not fall in, but it was a concern. Yes, people did memorize better back in those days than we do today. And they repeated things that they had heard better in those times than we do today but still it worried me. Now, there were bishops in each of the cities, bishops and deacons and presbyters, and people whose job it was to keep the gospel message solid in their community. So as the missionary like Peter or Paul moved on to another city, it was their job to keep it reliable in their city. And that kind of a picture helped me. That helped me to get over those uh, concerns about falling through the thin ice. And finally, a big question in my mind in those days, the 80s and 90s was, where is the eyewitness testimony? The scholars were talking about 
stories being maintained within communities, but they didn't talk during those decades very much about where the eyewitness testimony is. Who was the eyewitness who had the accounts that were put in the Gospels? I wanted to know. Well, beginning in the late 1990s and into the 2000s, a number of scholars researched that, studied that, and came up with a very satisfying model. And that's the model that uh, comes to us when we understand who Mark is. You see, we know virtually nothing about the Gospel writers. Mark? Well, Mark? Yes, Mark was an aide and interpreter for St. Peter. Peter knew some Greek. That was the international language. And Peter need to, needed to be able to communicate in that international language throughout the empire. So Peter needed an interpreter. Peter needed an assistant. And the most well-attested tradition is that that assistant's name was Mark. And that Mark was the one who wrote the gospel. So the eyewitness testimony that's in Mark's gospel is from Peter. But we know very little about Mark. We also know very little about St. Matthew and St. Luke. St. Matthew, oh yes, he'd, he was thought to be Matthew the tax collector, one of the 12 apostles, but that doesn't stack up with that gospel being written in the 80s. And it doesn't stack up with a model of Matthew's gospel being derived from Mark. So it's probably a different Matthew, a Matthew who was literate, a good communicator, someone who was able to accomplish that combining of Mark's text with the sayings of Jesus. And Luke? Well, we know very little about Luke. We know he was a physician. We know he spent some time with St. Paul because he's referred to in two or three of the letters of St. Paul. Beyond that, we know nothing of Luke. And John? Well, we know more about John than, and, uh, than of any of the other three. John was a disciple who was with Jesus, both in Galilee and in Jerusalem. He called himself the beloved disciple. He was there at the Last Supper. He was at the crucifixion. He was there at the crucifixion with Mary, the mother of Jesus. He was there when they laid him in the tomb. And John knew things that the other three Gospels didn't have in them. So John's, John's goal in writing a late gospel was to fill in detail that the other gospels didn't have. The story of the woman at the well, the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, the story of Jesus curing the blind man, and stories like that. So who was Mark? As I said, Mark most likely was St. Peter's aide and interpreter. The person who was at Peter's side, who spoke Greek, who wrote Greek and read Greek, and he would probably made notes. Sometimes perhaps he even spoke in Peter's place when Peter could not be in two places at the same time. And those notes that St. Mark made put him in the position of being the most able person to put the gospel in writing. Mark is not the John Mark that's mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles, nor Mark the cousin of Barnabas that is mentioned in Paul's letters. Hippolytus of Rome, Hippolytus who was a Christian Roman historian, attested that these are three different Marks. Mark, the assistant of St. Peter, and John Mark and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, are three different persons. That was attested way back 
in the second century. But there's always a tendency to try to add to the credibility of someone we know very little about. So throughout the ages of Christianity, these three marks have often been confused with one another. Mark may not be the person whose relics are enshrined at St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice. Uh, there's been intrigue about that all through the centuries, scandal and intrigue and questions. Don't ask me, I don't know whose relics they are. What I do know is the most well-attested tradition is that St. Mark was an aide and interpreter of Peter. Well, what were Mark's main concerns? First of all, putting what was known about Jesus into a written narrative. He started writing the gospel, tradition tells us, after Peter was executed. That must have been a passion, it must have been a passion burning in his heart to want to put everything that he had heard Peter say into a written form. That was his main concern. Mark also wanted to show that Jesus is the divine Son of God. So many of the accounts in Mark's gospel show Jesus with a power, the power to calm the storm, the power to cast out demons, the power to heal, the power to multiply loaves and fish. Very At the very top, of Mark's reasons is to show that Jesus is the divine Son of God. And Mark also wanted to demonstrate what authentic discipleship is like. And he did this through portraying people, followers of Jesus, as good examples and bad examples of discipleship. And very often, Peter himself was the example at Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? It was Peter who answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And yet, in the courtyard, well, Jesus was being interrogated by the high priest. Out in the courtyard where Peter was Concealing himself, the maidservant asked him, You were one of them, weren't you? And Peter said, No, I never knew the man. Peter denied Jesus three times. So through good examples and bad examples, all through the gospel, St. Mark is showing us what authentic discipleship needs to be. Mark probably had a pre-existing passion document, something that told about, uh, in his gospel chapters 14 on, that told from the agony in the garden through the crucifixion. Mark may have had access to the saying source, Q, we don't know, but Mark focused more on what Jesus did more so than what on Jesus said. Matthew and Luke came along and wanted to tell us what Jesus said, which is so important. The teachings of Jesus are so important. But Mark seemed to want to focus mostly on what Jesus did. Those were Mark's main concerns. Does Mark contain the eyewitness accounts of Peter? Yes. Yes, Peter is mentioned throughout, throughout the gospel. You can almost hear him speaking in those accounts of the day-to-day -day activities. And there are summaries. There are summaries like notes that a scribe might have written down who heard Peter give a lecture, heard Peter preach, notes that he made, and they're strung together like beads on a string, like pearls on a string. The accounts are not Pauline. They don't sound like St. Paul. 
They don't sound like they came from a follower of St. Paul. They don't have the concerns that St. Paul was concerned about. And they don't seem to be from Mary, either Mary. They don't mention very much Mary, the mother of Jesus, and they don't mention Mary Magdalene very much. A little bit, but not much. They don't seem to have their perspective. Now, wouldn't it have been wonderful if Mark had, had gathered some of the testimony from Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene, and perhaps other of the apostles and disciples? That would have been wonderful. But what we have is what we have. And what Mark started at the beginning, his gospel, what he put in writing is the first and most primitive version of the gospel message. Well, humans learn best from stories. I wanted to try to write, write a book that would convey some of this information that I've given you in the first half of the talk. And knowledge about the, the historical events that occurred at that time that I will tell you about in the second half of this talk. And a friend of mine says, why don't you put it into a historical novel? We know very little about Mark. We know very little if and to nothing about where and how he, he put the gospel in writing. We know he began while he was in Rome shortly after Peter was executed by the Romans. But we don't know much else. They said, my friend said, if you write a historical novel, you can, you can convey the method that Mark used and you can depict the historic of, historical events and they can ride in the chariot of an interesting story about a human being who was cooperating with the Holy Spirit to put the gospel in writing. I said, that sounds like a good idea. I think I'll give that a try. So I wrote Mark's Passion to show how the crucifixion of Peter was the crisis that led to the written text, to relate what it is like to follow a calling, to be led by the Holy Spirit. I wanted to demonstrate how divine inspiration and human passion interrelate and how they work together within the human heart. I wanted to flesh out Mark's primary concerns about showing that Jesus is the divine Son of God and his concern about what authentic discipleship is like. I wanted to convey details about the mid-first century and what a challenging period that was to be a Christian. And of course, to show how the gospel passages inspired their daily lives. So I did. I wrote a historical novel. I wrote Mark's Passion. It's the electrifying story of a young man's quest for love and his passion to put what was known about Jesus in writing. It's a novel, but all of the historical events that are depicted in this novel are accurate. It's available on Amazon.com in either print form as paperback or on Kindle. And if you're interested, you just go to Amazon, type in Mark's Passion, and that'll bring you right to the page. And at the end of this lecture, I'll give you a little more background and information on how you can make use of it. The study of Mark taught me many things. I really dug into this within the last couple of years, dug a lot deeper than I ever did at my studies at Seattle University. I learned that it is very difficult to be a Christian in the first century. Well, of course, it's difficult to be a Christian in any century, but certainly in the mid 60s, during the time that Mark was putting the gospel message in writing, that was a very difficult time. 
There were persecutions under Nero. The Emperor Nero, emperor from 54 to 68 AD. Nero was not a particularly good administrative leader. He was interested in the arts, in drama and music. He was kind of a playboy. He really wasn't that interested in governing the empire. And something happened though that triggered a series of persecutions while Nero was emperor. There was a great fire in the city of Rome in 64 AD. It was the worst fire the city ever had. So bad of a fire that they call it the Great Fire of Rome. It began on the night of July 18th to 19th of 64 AD. It began on a dry, windy night and it raged through the city. The, the winds blew the fire through the city. And Nero, Nero was said to be sitting in his palace, watching the flames and playing the lyra, singing and playing the lyra. Well, they said Nero wanted to reclaim these burned areas to build a new palace. And over the next three years, he did, in fact, reclaim a lot of the burned area and built a new palace. But initially, the public began to say, was it the emperor who set the fire? It was a terrible fire. It devastated half of the city and of Rome's histor uh, historic districts, only a few were untouched. Nero said, I'm not the one who lit the fire. I had nothing to do with it. It was the Christians. It was the Christians. And we're gonna punish them for what they did. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna punish them for the damage that they did to our city. And Nero began a series of persecutions to appease the population. Here's a drawing showing Romans in the Colosseum watching as Christians are being crucified on crosses while others are huddled together who soon will be mauled by beasts. And still others are put on, on fire pyres. They were burned at the stake while they were alive. This drawing shows the emperor and some of the elite Imagine being that close while people were burned at the stake. Christians were burned in great numbers, and the ones who were not burned at the stake, their corpses were burned at night. And the historians, historians say that the skies glowed from the fires where the corpses were burned each night. Well, at a certain point, Peter was taken to the Mamertine prison and Peter was executed. But something very unusual happened. They didn't bring him to the Colosseum. They brought Peter to a racetrack, a circus as it was called, a racetrack on a hill called Vatican Hill. It was located across the Tiber River from the Colosseum. And this is a slide that shows St. Peter's statue outside of St. Peter's Basilica today. When you go inside the Basilica, you see a large four-posted wooden structure, the Baldacchino, a structure that marks the place of Peter's remains below. And if you go down a flight of stairs, the public are allowed to go down this flight of stairs. You see a crypt and a coffin. This is simulated because the actual bones of Peter are another flight below. So it simulates the resting place of Peter. The public is not allowed to go down into the excavations below. This is what it looks like when Pope Francis visited the tomb below shortly after he became Pope. 
you go in there and it's been excavated in the 1960s. Yes, in the 1960s, the dirt was removed. They dug back in there, they found the bones and they found an inscription. That inscription was deciphered by an expert. Petros Eni, Peter is here. And the spot where those bones are is only three feet off center from the center of the Baldacino above. And what a great thing and a wonderful thing it is that St. Peter was not, was not executed in the Colosseum where his remains would have been burned that night. But instead, apparently, his body was taken from, by some Christians, by some Christians to a nearby garden and was buried there along with the inscription. And this slide will show you, just to get you oriented a little bit, the red line is the walls of the ancient city of Rome, showing the various historical district. The blue is the river Tiber that flows down through the middle from north to south at this point. And up in the upper left is Vatican Hill. That's where they brought St. Peter to execute him, and that's where Peter's remains lie. And down below, lower, in the bend of the river, you see where it says T-R-A-S-T-E-V-E-R-E, Trastevere. That Latin word means across the river. Most of the Christians lived in that neighborhood, and it's been a traditional neighborhood for Christians throughout the centuries. St. Mark did not live in that neighborhood, though. Uh, there's a very well-attested tradition that St. Mark lived in a little house, possibly not his own house, but he lived with other people, at the foot of the Capitoline Hill, very close to the river. It was swampy in that area. And St. Mark's church marks the spot today where, tradition tells us, St. Mark lived and St. Mark began to write the gospel. Of course, it was, it was very dangerous for him to stay in Rome. So Mark had to leave Rome, probably left very suddenly, probably had only the clothes he was, could carry and the notes that he had made of Peter's talks about Jesus. And he had to go somewhere else to finish the gospel. This shows the Tiber River today. It's not a large river, just a modest amount of water that flows from there about 20 miles to the Mediterranean Sea on the west coast of the Italian peninsula. Fear was growing. The persecutions of Nero set off, set off fear. Can you imagine with all those Christians being uh, burned and crucified and mauled by beasts. Was this the end times? Is this the end times that Jesus predicted? That must have been a question on every Christian's mind. Well, the emperor clearly was crazy. He wasn't just incompetent. He wasn't just a poor administrator. He was deranged. The army was ruthless. The system was stacked against the people. All over the empire, it was stacked against the people. We know it was in Judea, but that's the way the empire worked. The elite cooperated with Rome. The kings and the elite and the wealthy cooperated with Rome, and that's how they maintained their position. And it was stacked against the poor. Imperial power was growing. Where is God? They must have said, where is God? Where is God? A terrible, terrible, fearful time to be a Christian. In addition to what was going on in Rome, 
There was unrest in Galilee and Judea. Galilee is a beautiful country. If you went there today, this is a view from the Mount of Beatitudes where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. It's a beautiful, peaceful country. This is a view from Gennesaret, a few miles south of Capernaum, an agricultural area. Looks very peaceful. The Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long and eight miles wide, a small body of water, although it's the largest body of fresh water on earth that is below sea level. And it's a beautiful, beautiful blue reflecting the blue skies. The unrest had been building for a long time. It began with a cruelty under Herod the Great. This is King Herod. King Herod, who was the king at the time that Jesus was born. He ruled from 39 BC to, to 4 BC. And he's called Herod the Great because he did so many uh, immense building projects throughout the country of Judea and the eastern part of the empire, other places, mostly in Judea. This slide shows Jerusalem. You can kind of see the temple complex there in the upper part of the slide. The big flat structure, the flat platform with colonnades around the edges and a huge temple in the middle. That's Herod's temple. It was a beautiful rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple. The slide shows the older city of David in the lower right part. And then you can see where the buildings get larger in the upper city, the city of Zion. Uh, you can see the city walls and so forth. That's the original uh, Jerusalem at the time of Christ. But cruelty and oppression were one of the hallmarks of Herod the Great. The unrest continued under Herod Antipas, one of the many sons of King Herod, who had 10 wives. Herod Antipas was Tetrarch of Galilee from 6 AD to 39 AD. He's the one who's referred to as King Herod at the time that Jesus' public years and Jesus' crucifixion. Taxation was the issue. This shows the city of Tiberias that Herod reconstructed, improved the city walls, improved the harbor, built many buildings, and a beautiful colonnaded main street that ran through the town and on farther up north, covered walkways on both sides where people could shop and visit with one another in the shade. And they had a stadium, as you can see in the left part of the picture. Now this was more of a Roman city. This was a city where the elite of Galilee lived, along with the capital of Galilee, Sephorus. It was a very, very different place than the cities where the average Jewish people lived in Galilee such as Capernaum and Magdala and Gennesaret, which were just a few miles north. The cooperation of the Jewish leadership is essential to make the machinery run. This view of the temple complex shows how enormous it was and what a huge undertaking it must have been to build it. They said that when they finished the construction, the unemployment was a big problem because all the people were suddenly put out of work who had been employed in the construction of this project. On the lower left, you can see the steps that pilgrims entered. This would include pilgrims like Joseph and Mary and Jesus when they visited the temple when Jesus was 12 years old. They'd enter up those lower steps, go in and come up some more inner steps to come up to the first courtyard. When Jesus was a boy, the money changers were down below. 
But when he was in his public years, when he got angry at how the money changers were making uh, a noise in the temple and disturbing the activity of the temple, those activities had been moved up to this upper court. This picture shows an excavation and partial reconstruction of the synagogue in Capernaum. It's two rooms. And do you remember the story early in Mark's gospel where Jesus casts out a demon out of a man who was in the synagogue? The story goes that Jesus came into the synagogue and there was a man there who was possessed by a demon. And the demon said, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Don't cast us out. Well, Jesus did cast him out. Jesus had divine power. He could cast out demons. But in addition to that, there's a symbolic message. The demon was in the synagogue. The demon, symbolically in, this, in the synagogue, were the Pharisees and scribes, the local leaders in the city, this city being Capernaum. But in every Jewish city, there was a demon in the synagogue. It's important to understand that the people were catching on, and Jesus was the one they looked to that could cast them out. Then we had the rise of the Sicarii. A Sicarii is a long curved dagger, anywhere from one foot long to 18 inches long. And a person could carry it under their clothing. They did carry it under their clothing and they approached the wealthy. They approached the wealthy when they were in crowds, stabbed them, and then the assailant would let go of the dagger and scream like you see that man screaming with his arms up. Who did that? Who did that? Somebody just stabbed this guy. Well, that was going on a lot. And the wealthy were complaining to the governor, or the Roman governor, something's got to be just done to stop these stabbings. Well, by 66 AD, there was fever mounting for an actual rebellion against Rome not just unrest, but the desire to form an independent Jewish nation. That came about by reflecting upon the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, and other Old Testament books that showed how God would help the Jewish people to overthrow their oppressors. This is a painting by Raphael done in 1518 showing vision, the vision of Ezekiel. But that was where they were coming from as more and more people began to talk about a rebellion against Rome. They even got an army formed in Galilee under a young general, Joseph ben Mattathias, because both the Judeans and the Galileans knew that if they rebelled against Rome, that Rome would attack them and that Rome would bring their army in beginning in Galilee. They'd begin in Galilee in the north. They'd subdue Galilee, attempt to subdue Galilee. And then they'd march down to Judea, get control of rural Judea, and then circle Jerusalem and they would conquer Jerusalem. But the Jews felt with God on their side that they could stage a successful rebellion. And they, they got Joseph ben Mathathias to form an army of Galileans who would be their first line of defense against the potential Roman invasion. Then in the same year, a freedom fighter named Manahem captured the mountain fortress of Masada. Now, there's several stages of the story of Masada. Originally, uh, it just stood there as an empty mountain, but Herod the Great built 
a three-level getaway fort and vacation cottage. The, you see the three levels on the left side, upper and middle and lower levels on the left side of the mountain. That's the north side. And what a magnificent view it has up the whole Jordan Valley. Herod the Great built that part and fortified the entrance and thought that he would use it if he needed to, to be a getaway, a hideout, if he needed to flee from any sort of attack on his person. Well, by 66 AD, Herod the Great was no longer living, and the Romans had taken this over, and it was a garrison for Roman soldiers. So Roman soldiers had the occupancy of this mountaintop fortress, and the Jewish freedom fighter Manahem somehow captured it. How he captured it, no one knows. It must have involved trickery because it's, a, it's an impregnable fortress. But through some method of tre treachery, Manahem captured it. He slew the Roman soldiers. There was a vast store of weapons and he took them down to give them to the Jewish fighters who would use them against the Romans. Then, also in 66 AD, Jerusalem began to delay making tax payments to Rome. Uh-oh, something's gotta give. Gotta keep those tax payments flowing or something is gonna happen. Then, also in 66 AD, the high priest Hananiah convinced the council, the Sanhedrin, that they needed to end doing sacrifices on behalf of the Emperor Nero. I'm sure this comes as a surprise to you, it came as a surprise to me, to learn that they were doing sacrifices for the benefit of the Emperor. Because it's abhorrent to Jews to consider sacrificing animals and plants to do any kind of sacrifice to anybody but God. It's abhorrent to think of sacrifices for the benefit of the emperor. But by 66 AD, they were doing it. And the emperor was paying the chief priests to make the sacrifices. It was part of the system. And the new high priest Hananiah said, this is outside of our tradition. If we want God to be on our side, we have to end the sacrifices to the Roman emperor. Well, the council agreed. They ended the sacrifices and Rome considered it an open act of rebellion. Herod Agrippa II, great-grandson of, Herod, of uh, Herod the Great, he can't keep control of Judea. Then Eleazar, another freedom fighter, he had a great idea. All the records of the debt that the poor people owed to the wealthy were kept in a building in Jerusalem, the debt records. And Eleazar got the bright idea of setting them on fire. He thought, boy, that'd make me popular with the people. And he did. He burned them. He burned them all. The debt records were gone. Wow, this is turning into a total rebellion. Manahem came down uh, and returned to Jerusalem. And now we had a civil power struggle. Not a civil war, just a power struggle at this point between the high priests who controlled the upper city and the temple and the freedom fighters who controlled the lower city and the less affluent people of Jerusalem. Well, yes, Rome had to respond. And they had to respond in a strong and powerful way. And they looked around and asked, who is the most experienced general do we have? Who's the most experienced general who can get down there and wrap this up and teach those Jews a lesson? 
we have him. We've got General Vespasian. So Vespasian is appointed governor of Palestine. He looks like a tough guy, doesn't he? I wouldn't want to mess with him. Vespasian is appointed governor of Palestine. He sails to Antioch where there are two legions of soldiers and his son Titus is already in Alexandria, Egypt with one legion of soldiers and they're prepared for the invasion. This slide shows the network of Roman roads in ancient Roman Empire. This is like the interstate highway system of that time. The upper part of the slide shows a typical section of Roman highway. It's wide enough for eight soldiers to march side by side with their packs and their carts with supplies and so forth are trailing behind them. And they can cover almost 20 miles a day when the, if the soldiers are in good condition for marching that far. And you can see in the map that there are roads all over the empire that were built primarily for this purpose. And over on the eastern edge, right next to the blue Mediterranean Sea, if you look closely, you'll see Antioch. That's where the two legions were. And in the middle, Caesarea. That's part of Palestine. And down on the south side, Alexandria in Egypt. That's where the one legion was that, were, uh, that was under Titus. And they began to march. Vespasian marched southward from Antioch. Titus marched northward from Alexandria. And they came in where that white arrow, that white arrow is that points toward the word Galilee. They came right in there at Galilee. The capital of Galilee, Sephorus, is right there between Cana and Nazareth. And that was the capital city of the province. Further, you see Capernaum and Tiberias, the cities that are along the Sea of Galilee. They marched in there and it didn't take them very long to, uh, to get moving and to have contact with the people. What about Joseph's forces? Joseph ben Methotheus, he's there to stop them. He's there to stop them. But when his army sees the huge force of Roman columns, they turn on their heels and flee. Very few of them wanted to even engage the Roman soldiers. Well, Vespasian heard about that army and he chased Joseph. He chased Joseph all the way to, get to the Sea of Galilee and then up to a small walled city called Jotapata where Joseph thought he could hide, but Vespasian they don't leave anybody behind. They besieged the city. They broke through the walls. They found Joseph, even though he was hiding, and they brought him to the feet of Vespasian and Titus. And what did Joseph do? Joseph said, hi guys, I'm your friend. I can help you. I can be of real value to you. I know these people. I know their ways. I know their roads. I know their cities. He defected to the other side. Joseph became a Roman. He was a Jewish Roman, of course. He even changed his name to Josephus. He lived his rest of his life in riches. And he's the one who wrote the history of the Jews and the history of the Jewish war against Rome that are known as the history of Josephus. And you may have heard about these history books. They're usually published today in one volume. Vespasian conquered Galilee, overwhelming force. There was no question that he would subdue that territory.
But people began to ask, all over the empire, Christians began to ask, what's going to happen to the Christians in Jerusalem? There was a large Christian community in Jerusalem, originally led by James, the brother of the Lord or cousin of the Lord. James, however, had been executed by the Sanhedrin by this point in time, but there were a number of Christians there. What would happen to them? They were on nobody's side. They were not on the side of the Jews, so the Jews considered them traitors. They certainly were not on the side of the Romans. What would happen to them? Probably the best thing for them would have been to leave their homes and leave their businesses and flee. But they didn't. They stayed. So the question uh, echoed throughout the Christian world, what's going to happen to them? Well, 68 to 69 AD was a time of transition. Early in 68, Vespasian conquered rural Judea. No problem. Wrap that up. His forces circled Jerusalem. He was ready to move in for the siege. But then something happened that brought the whole thing to a pause. Nero was dead. Yes, Nero was dead. Nero's excesses had sickened the Senate, and the Senate voted to have Nero assassinated, to actually have him beat to death by his peers. This is a drawing of the Roman soldiers coming to catch Nero at a hideout. But just before the soldiers broke in and captured him, Nero cut his throat. Yes, Nero killed himself. Suicide was common in the pagan culture. It's abhorrent to Christians to consider suicide, but it was considered an honorable way for a leader such as Nero to die. Better to die nobly through suicide than to be beaten with sticks and rods by his peers. And with Nero out of the way, the empire needed a new Caesar. And they did. They picked Galba, then Otto, then Vitalius. And neither one lasted even six months. They all were executed, executed or suicide. They didn't last very long. So as we get into 69, two things happen that are interesting. The Christians during this lull did decide to leave Jerusalem in uh, caravans. They could go in and out during this period of time. And in this map, you see the blue Jordan River and about halfway between Galilee and Judea on the right side, the east side, you see that little city of Pella? That's where they went. And it was a position of relative safety. They stayed there until after the war. And after the war was over, a lot of them returned to Jerusalem and attempted to rebuild their businesses and their homes where they had come from. Well, who was the next emperor after Galba and Otto and Vitalius, the most popular leader in the empire was Vespasian. And the Senate tapped Vespasian to be the next emperor. Here's another painting by Rubens. Vespasian just looks a little different, doesn't he? With a garland around his head and a, and a red robe on, he doesn't look quite the same. But Vespasian is made emperor, and he leaves Titus as the general in charge of all the forces to finalize the siege of Jerusalem. Vespasian goes to Rome, and Titus begins the siege. Siege warfare is a terrible thing. A terrible 
terrible way to break in, burn, and starve out a city. The Romes don't crumble immediately. The armies move towers in place where they can throw incendiary objects in and get fire started in the city. There's no way in, there's no way out. The city is circled. Food begins to get short. The Romans build a wall of their own to keep anybody from escaping from the city of Jerusalem. The siege continues. Fire, missiles, lances, until they break through. Food shortages, oh, the food shortages were terrible. You know, the Jews believed that God would be on their side. It said so in the scriptures. Of course, there were plenty of scriptures where God did not take the side of the Jews, and they lost wars. But they weren't looking at those scriptures. They were only looking at the scriptures where the war was won by the power of God. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Many of the people starved. And by 70 AD, Jerusalem is totally destroyed. This is a sad story. I'm sorry to be telling you such a sad story, <coughs> but it is a very sad story. It didn't need to happen. It didn't need to happen, but it did happen. And just as Jesus had predicted, not one stone was left upon a stone. The soldiers didn't just burn everything they could, they dismantled the buildings. They dismantled them so that not one stone was left upon a stone. The only thing that was left was a section of wall on the western side that the Jews now call the Wailing Wall. And Titus? Well, General Titus, he heads to Rome, of course where they built the Arch of Titus, where they made an inscription that shows Roman soldiers carrying off the booty from the temple in Jerusalem. Titus is a great hero, and he will follow in his father's footsteps as the next emperor. In Jerusalem, Jerusalem is left destroyed. Not one stone is left upon a stone. This is a picture of an archaeological park. It's an excavation that has been made a park, and it's usually kind of quiet in there. When I was in there, I, I saw the rubble. Uh, the Jews have left them uh, today. The Jews of today have left this as a sign of destruction for pilgrims to go in, to kind of ponder the futility of war, and to ponder what happens when two great forces come at one another with their full, full vengeance. Of course, there were about a thousand Jews up in Masada that had been captured by Manahem about a thousand Jews up there, men, women, and children. Titus left Flavia Silva to go up there and kill them all. And it took Silva three years, no trickery this time, no, it took Silva three years to build a siege ramp on the uphill side. That ramp that goes up the uphill side that you see in the picture and when they finally completed it after three years of effort and were ready to break through the next morning, the thousand Jews killed themselves that night with poison and swords. They killed the women, they killed the children, and rather than be taken slaves, they killed one another 
and the last one fell on his own sword. All the Romans saw the next morning was deathly silence. And the story ends with the end of priestly Judaism. Yes, the temple is destroyed and the priests are killed. Very few of the priestly class escaped. Priestly Judaism is done. That is, the temple Judaism, where pilgrims brought uh, animals and other goods to the temple to sacrifice them to Yahweh, that's over. Judaism continued out in the cities and the villages throughout the world by the rabbis. Rabbinic Judaism continued, and that's what we have as Judaism today. But Temple Judaism is no more. A very sad ending of a very sad story. But Christians need to know about the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the city in 70 AD, because Jesus had predicted it that not one stone would be left upon a stone. Where is Mark in all this? Yeah, I began this lecture talking about Mark, and I'm ending it talking about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Where was Mark? We know he began putting the gospel in writing while he was in Rome. But then he escaped Rome, and we know he did finish putting the gospel in writing because we have it today. But questions remain. Why didn't Mark write more? Was he still alive? Did Mark know the outcome of the war? Why didn't Mark tap other sources like John or Mary Magdalene or Mary the mother of Jesus or any of the other disciples who might have told him more? Why didn't any of that seem to take place? We don't know the answers. We don't know the answers. What we have is what we have. The good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God written by St. Mark. That's what we have. And there are ways to follow up. I hope you hear the gospel with a new understanding and understand uh, how the gospel began as a verbal, oral message of hope message of hope about Jesus of Nazareth, the one that was crucified and who was raised by his father, that message of hope that spread throughout the cities of the Roman Empire. And I hope you'll look for a happy ending. There was no happy ending in the war. Never is. But I hope you'll think about where was God? Where was God in helping that message of Jesus to be spread, to be spread to all nations, where the gospel could be preached to all nations. I hope you'll let grace build up your faith, and I hope you'll allow Christ to change your life. Because if you do, then the story does have a happy ending. The story is, does some good. It has a purpose, and that purpose is to empower more Christians today to do our part to build up the kingdom of God. And if you'd like to follow up by reading a historical novel about St. Mark and those challenging times, I urge you to get a copy of Mark's Passion. Yes, I wrote it. It's not a profit-making venture, however. That's why I'm putting it in here as a mini commercial. Yes, I have several hundred dollars invested in this project, 
And as I began to recruit them through book sales, I'm going to spend it on advertising because I'm not trying to make a profit. I'm trying to spread the word about Mark and spread a work spread the word about the challenging times in which he put the gospel in writing. So get the book. About 100 people have read it at this point in time. They say it's an interesting read. It's an exciting story. It's a very human story about a young man putting his own life together and putting the gospel in writing. I also offer free downloads at markspassion.com. There you can get an article uh, that shows illustrations and maps of the first century events, links to store study sources if you want to follow up on this more, an article entitled What New Scholars, What New Testament Scholars Are Saying Today, that'll help you solidify that picture in your mind about the dates in which the Gospels were written, the sequence in which they were written, how Matthew and Luke drew upon other sources in addition to Mark, and how John filled in detail that Mark and Matthew and Luke did not have. So reading the book will be an avenue that, um, that you can get more out of what you've begun through this lecture. And if you like the book, recommend it to a friend, because that's how we pass along what we've learned. That's how we pass along what we've learned about Mark and the challenging time in which he put the gospel in writing.